here with, uh, with Kevin O'Rourke. Thank you for spending some time with us. You're welcome. Um, you are Irish and, and, and a leading thinker uh, on, on the Irish economy as, long, as well as many other uh, issues. Ireland at one time uh, was the country that, that by, by many measures probably gained the most from having been a member of the Eurozone and joining all of the different institutions that constitute um, the monetary union. How do leaders in Ireland conduct policy now that that, that decision looks by many of the same measures to have been a mistaken decision? Okay, so I think that um, Ireland is still one of the countries that has benefited the most from being a member of the European Union. And I think you always want to distinguish between our membership of the Union, on the one hand, and our membership of European Monetary Union, on the other hand. I guess the second thing to say about our membership of EMU is that um, uh, for sure there are now very big costs that are being imposed upon us, big gross costs, but there are also arguably big gross benefits that we gain as a result of being a member of a common currency because we have multinationals who invest in Ireland who like being a member, like being in the Eurozone, like being able to do their business you know, from their bases in Ireland uh, in a common currency. Um, so it's a slightly nuanced picture, but for sure right now uh, it doesn't look like it was such a great idea. Uh, it led to an inflow of, of capital. Uh, the perception was there was no risk involved and it led to a classic real estate bubble and so on. Uh, again, though, I would have to say there's a bit of a nuance there because Iceland is not a member of the Eurozone, and yet they had something similar happen. And Thailand is even more clearly not a member of the Eurozone, and they had something similar happen uh, in 1997. So, yes, I probably do think that an approximate cause of what happened was our membership of the Euro, but you can't really prove that. It's part of a broader phenomenon of hot capital flowing in and out of economies. In retrospect, the fact that the Thai crisis hit in '97 should have meant that policymakers, when we entered EMU, you know, just a few months later, you know, should have been thinking about how to, you know, uh, make sure this didn't happen in Ireland, but they didn't, they didn't do so. Insofar as the political responses and so on are concerned, I mean, uh, we have one of the most Europhile populations in Europe traditionally, and our politicians completely reflect that. We've just had a general election that has seen the ele election of a government with with Labour and Fine Gael, which is a centre-right party, and they're both extremely Europhile. So, so the politicians that are leading us now uh, are extremely Europhile, and they're quite sort of conservative in the sense of not wanting to rock the boat. And I would love to be a fly of the wall in the cabinet and hear about how they're discussing you know, the current situation with the bondholders and so on, because for sure they came in feeling that they had a mandate to burden share, and for sure, they're telling us themselves uh, that was vetoed in, in Europe. So it's not clear now how they're going to respond. I mean, the problem is they don't have any good options because we still have a primary deficit that needs to be financed. Now, if it hadn't been for the banking crisis, we could have financed that primary deficit on the markets perfectly well. If it hadn't been for the banking crisis, we wouldn't have had a stock of debt that would have excluded us from markets. But, you know, we are where we are. We have this deficit. Uh, the only people financing us are the Troika, and if the ECB, which is part of that Troika, is, 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 is vetoing uh, attempts to burden share, it's very difficult to see how you get around that. you just got to keep on arguing the case, you know, and you've got to argue that um, it's unsustainable, you know, not make it a moral argument necessary, just say it's not going to work, uh, that ultimately if we end up socialising all of these debts, it's going to lead to a sovereign default. That's in nobody's interests, and it probably isn't in the interests of Europe as a whole to see you know, member states uh, be pushed further and further uh, down. So, so we've got to appeal to other member states' uh, sense of, of self-interest. But for sure, I think the last couple of weeks have been rather traumatic for the, for the new government, I, I imagine. Do you think that the, that the way the crisis has unfolded in, Ireland, unfolded in Ireland the last few weeks and months has eaten into the Irish affinity for being a part of a broader Europe. M many agree that, that, that the, the guarantee of the banking liabilities a couple of years back was uh, a bad idea for Ireland, but, but nevertheless was a good idea for the rest of Europe at the time. Um, and yet it doesn't feel like the rest of Europe is, is reciprocating in kind and accommodating Ireland. And to the extent that that's a popular view in Ireland, does that begin to erode the, the, the base of, of support for remaining a member? The government 
and Patrick Honahan have been trying to argue that indeed Europe owes us because we guaranteed these creditors of Irish banks and that therefore out of gratitude they should cut us some slack. Now, uh, if I remember back to 2008, uh, at the time, I mean, certainly Gordon Brown uh, and his government were pretty angry with the Irish because they saw this as, as causing them difficulties. They saw the, you know, that they would have uh, money flowing into Irish uh, accounts from British accounts. And, and Merkel uh, seems to have been absolutely furious at what was seen as a unilateral decision. So it isn't clear that we were doing this you know, to be nice to other Europeans, and it isn't clear that other Europeans were particularly grateful. Now, the only slight qualification there is that it is sometimes suggested that the European Central Bank said things to that government that made it think that uh, this unilateral decision would meet favour with the European Central Bank, but I haven't seen any proof of that assertion whatsoever. Insofar as public opinion is concerned, yeah, I mean, the punters can see through the complications pretty easily. They know that we're being lent money not just to finance uh, the state, but to pay back foreign creditors of Irish banks, and they don't really feel that they should be grateful for that. And I think the one thing that we have to make sure is that there isn't a confusion between, uh, say, the European Central Bank or the European Commission and Europe as a whole or other Europeans or other member states. Because it isn't, for example, entirely clear to me that other taxpayers in other member states should be pleased with this policy of making all of the bondholders whole because if we can't pay back all of the money then we won't and then it's going to fall on somebody else's taxpayers shoulders you know so I think I think we've got to you know for example uh, not uh, make easy analogies between the ECB and Germany and pretend that these are the same things it's not clear they have the same interests at all uh, as regards this banking crisis. In your remarks earlier today you cited uh, poll data that suggested that, that Europe and European institutions were a lot more popular among those who had or who expect pensioners, uh, perhaps wealthier strata of society and less popular with the unemployed, for example. Does that, does the way in which Europe, Europe and European institutions have addressed the crisis, which is to insist on continuing to service debt and insisting on austerity. Does that create a, a perverse political dynamic within, within Europe in the sense that, that the, the way in which the crisis is addressed amplifies some of these cleavages and thereby reducing even further or making even more unpopular Europe itself and, 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 and these institutions? And is, is there a risk that this uh, positive feedback loop can can, can spin out of control in Europe? Certainly the crisis right now in a country like Ireland has increased, I think, anti-European resentment among the people who weren't doing that well out of integration in the first place. And so the spokespeople for those constituencies, Sinn Féin, did actually very well in the last uh, general election. And then the real problem is that simultaneously in the creditor countries, you have the true Finns in Finland, uh, basically representing people who feel that there's no reason why they should be forced to bail out these feckless, uh, you know, Mediterraneans or, or Irish uh, or whatever. And, and that's happening in a context where already, because of, uh, you know, popular dislike of, of, of immigration, uh, you know, there was a rise of, uh, anyway of populist parties, you know, in Denmark, uh, in Sweden, in the Netherlands, you know, in, in Hungary and, and so on. So for sure the direction is going to be in the, in the direction that you suggest now. Now how big this shift is going to be, we're only, you know, we're just going to have to see. Uh, I mean Sinn Féin did very well, but it only got 15 seats in the Irish uh, Parliament. Um, if things improve, you know, you would expect uh, things to settle down, you know, but on the other hand, I mean, Sinn Féin did very well in this election, and that was only after three or four months uh, of, you know, the Troika ruling the roost in Ireland. If you give this three, four more years, you know, you, you, you would begin to, to worry a little bit about what the backlash would be. And, and to be honest, I wouldn't even so much fear Sinn Féin, which has, you know, been in government in Northern Ireland at this stage, I mean, has left its terrorist past behind it and so on. I mean, they, they have some pretty crazy economic policies, but on, 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 on say, burden sharing and, and various other things that they, they do speak 
a lot of sense. I'd worry more about the unknown unknowns out there, about the right-wing populist parties that might emerge out of left field, out of right field and campaign on anti-immigration platforms and anti-European platforms. Shifting gears a little bit, this is, you're, you're a well-known economic historian and this is a, um, a uh, conference about economic thinking and new economic thinking in particular. How much new economic thinking do you think is required and how much old or very old economic thinking might be useful to, to, to this new economic thinking? Well, so I suppose wearing my economic history hat, I, I, I would want to say that what is I think very important for the profession is that we look at data and we look at old economic experiences and past experiences. And once you open your mind and look at historical experience, you realize that you know, uh, the different models may be appropriate in different circumstances, that there may not be one global model that fits all realities, you know, that sometimes you're in a world that's well described by Keynesian models, at other times you may be in, in very different worlds, and so on. What this crisis has shown, I think, is that when you are in a situation where you really have to react to very rapidly moving events, it's helpful to have economists around who actually know a bit of history, who know something about the real world. Um, so it's no surprise that people like Barry Eichengreen, you know, have been very much in demand. The other thing that economic history gives you, apart from a, a sense of the contingency of the appropriateness of models, is it gives you a sense of the importance of, of institutions, it gives you a sense of the importance of the interaction between the political and the economic. You know, we were talking today about the Eurozone crisis. History is littered with examples of international economic institutions that collapsed because the economics was demanding one set of policies and the politics was making that you know, impossible. And so I think that economic historians are far, far more intellectually equipped to think about rupture and discontinuities and dramatic change and maybe black swan events, therefore, or, or whatever. You know, in a sense, we've seen it all before. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time, Kevin. You're very welcome.